grateful today to the Maxwell Institute for their tremendous support of this conference and the week that scholars have had together preceding the conference. Uh, we'd like to thank Rachel, Blair, Soraya, Lily, Lilia, Jeremy, and Sandra. Everything has gone so smoothly and beautifully, and they've really given us uh, an important week. I'd like to thank our other sponsors for the conference. It's written very small, so if you're over 40, you might struggle to read them. Uh, BYU Women's Studies, the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, Claremont Graduate University, the Kennedy Center for International Studies, the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics, the Church History Department, and the Tanner Humanities Center. This week and this conference are really important uh, not just for the field of women's history, but for the broader field as well. And this effort to provide resources and space uh, to meet and to think have, have been a great contribution both to the field of women's history and broader fields. Well, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Laurie Maffley Kipp, who is a professor of American Religious Studies at Washington University. I don't think Kate. Uh, I don't think Kate introduced herself. Did you? Did no. you do? <laughs> Kate Holbrook um, and I have been fortunate enough to lead um, a consultation over the last week, in, of which this is the culminating and celebratory event for us. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about that meeting and the week that we have, the marvelous week that we've had here. Um, we. Um, Kate and I just wanted to find a way to support the field of um, women's history, but particularly um, the, the experience of uh, uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, in comparative perspective. Um, and Spencer Fluman at the Maxwell Institute was gracious enough and generous enough to help us find a way to do that. And, so we put out a call um, for applications for people who had interests in research interests in the field, however broadly defined, and ended up with 90 applications that were quite astounding to us. There is such a wealth of um, intelligence and interest out there that we were uh, sort of overwhelmed, first of all, but also really encouraged about the kinds of things that um, people are thinking about and how, and the ways in which they're furthering all kinds of research. Um, so we ended up with 14 women um, who came for a week. They'll, they'll come for a week next year and another week the year after that. So we'll keep the momentum going <coughs> to discuss uh, their research and writing and to generate ideas for further research in Mormon women's history. Um, they're working on, on fascinating research projects, and I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list now, but I just want to mention a few of the topics to sort of whet your appetite for the future. Um, these topics range from stories of the first women missionaries to England, the history of silk production and women's labor, studies of women's religious experiences in Mauritius, Rwanda, Ireland, and Great Britain, uh, migrants, stories of migrants from Haiti and from Latin America, studies of native peoples and their relationship to the LDS church, Mormon women and war, Mormon women and family. As you see, there's an incredible wealth of knowledge and experience um, that women are bringing, these women are bringing to sort of exciting fields of study. And today we're happy to have um, a, a conference that, that highlights not that work, because that work is still very much in process and in, in progress, but um, the work and the, the thinking of some of our um, inspirations this week. The, yesterday we brought in uh, four outside consultants who you'll be hearing, all of whom you'll be hearing from today, to talk to the participants about their work, to give them suggestions, to nudge them along in one way or another. So um, you will hear their voices today talking about some of their experiences in the field. And of course, uh, the, this will culminate in um, a, a talk by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, who was the inspiration for much of this in her pioneering work over the years. Thank you. Thank you. 
in case you haven't opened the blue folder on your chair, there, this is a program to help you know what to expect for the day. Uh, we have two sessions and then a lunch from 1 to 2 p.m. All of you are invited to enjoy lunch. The Maxwell Institute has provided that for us. And they are box lunches that will just be on tables right outside the door here. So that's 1 to 2 p.m. Then we all have two additional sessions and um, complete the conference at 5 p.m. We will leave space for your questions at, at the end of every session, 15 or 20 minutes. So please, as you find something that's stimulating to you or you'd like to hear um, an expert s respond to, uh, make, a, make a note of them and look forward to the Q&A portion of each session. And now I would like to invite Cherry Silver here to an introduce our first guest scholars. Cherry herself is a pillar and uh, pioneer in the field of Latter-day Saint women's history. With you, I'm very glad to be able to welcome these two distinguished scholars who are here to talk to us about their ideas and perspectives from in a broader lens. Andy Browdy is a senior lecturer on American religious history at Harvard Divinity School. She directs the Women's Studies and Religion program there. Anne's books include Radical Spirits, Spiritualism and Women's Rights in 19th Century America, and a title that should catch our interest, Sisters and Saints, Women and American Religion, a History of the Religion of American Women for a General Audience. She also has a particular interest in study of Native American religions, and many other contributions to articles and edited volumes. One thing that caught my interest, like Laurel, some years ago she invited Harvard to look at its own history when she gave a convocation address to the Harvard Divinity School entitled A Short Half Century, 50 Years of Women at Harvard Divinity School, reminding then that women had not been there the whole time, but fortunately were now. Colleen McDonnell is Professor of History and the Sterling M. McMurrin Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Utah. She specializes in the history of the United States and is particularly interested in how religion shapes American culture and society. Her recent book, Sister Saints, Mormon Women Since the End of Polygamy has sparked intense interest as she observes local women and their religious experience. Earlier she published Heaven, a History, Material Christianity, and the Spirit of Vatican II, Catholic Reform in America. Professor McDonnell, as many of you know, is a mentor to those in women's religious studies locally. Now we're privileged to hear these two women. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to give a little bit of a summary of what we're planning on doing. And I have some timekeepers sitting in the front row that will hold up little pieces of paper when we begin to wander away. So what we're going to be doing is I will begin by interviewing Anne, who is a very dear uh, friend who I've known for many, many years. So if you, uh, you want to grab us after, we'll tell you the secret stories of each other. It'll be fun. <laughs> and that will, that will, we'll do that until about 1040, and then we'll switch roles, and, and Anne will interview me. And Hopefully, I will be able to respond cogently. And then around 11 o'clock, if we are on time, we will open it up for our questions from the audience. So that's how we're going to, to run this, this session. So I just want to quickly thank the, um, the organizers for all of their hard work. We had a wonderful session yesterday with many engaging scholars and we look forward to seeing their publications in the future and how their bright careers will develop. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start first by asking um, Anne some very broad questions about the Women's Studies program 
the Women's Studies and Religion program at Harvard. And I'd like her to, to give us a bit of its history, how did it begin, and what it does, what it does for the community of Harvard, but also the larger community of scholars around the United States. And then a little bit about her own personal involvement with that. So that's the first tough question. And then we'll move on to other ones that are equally difficult to answer. I think I can manage it. Um, thank you so much, Colleen. And thanks to Lori and Kate and to our hosts, to Spencer and um, the Maxwell Institute. This is really thrilling to be here. Um, and. Uh, I I, did you guys like think of what would be the most p fun possible thing for Anne and Colleen to do? Um, this is like a dream come true that we get to interview each other. This is what we do for fun is, you know, Colleen calls me up in the middle of the night and we talk about women's history. Um, We're truly nerds. Truly nerds, truly nerds, lifelong sisters in, uh, in this project. I think it's pretty funny, actually, that I wrote a book called Sisters and Saints, and she wrote a book called Sister Saints. Um, we didn't plan that. But anyway, um, the Women's Studies and Religion program at Harvard Divinity School, I think, is really a great place to start this conversation because I was reminded of it a lot yesterday when we were speaking with the young scholars about their work and what it meant to them to come together as a group of women studying LDS history and bringing it into the field of women's studies and all the kinds of cross-fertilization that could happen. That's a lot of what we do in the Women's Studies and Religion program at the Divinity School. The program started in the early 70s in kind of that incredible moment of feminist ferment um, when uh, the young women who had really just started coming to the Divinity School in large numbers noticed that they were not reading any books by women that there were none on the syllabi, that there were no women on the faculty, and uh, they kind of felt left out. So um, one of the first things they did, it's really dangerous to ask me to talk about the history of the program because the hour could go very fast, but I'll just tell one anecdote and then I'll try to move through the decades a little more quickly. Um, one of the first things they did in the 70s was, um, there were some, uh, we, we have a theological consortium in Boston. The students can cross register with uh, at different seminaries and theological schools throughout the area. And um, so some of the students had gone to Boston College and taken a course with Mary Daly. And they came back and they said to Harvey Cox, who was uh, teaching a course on social justice, that um, they wanted to have a section on women's issues in the class and they were gonna bring kazoos. And every time they heard the masculine pronoun used to refer to humanity, uh, they were gonna blow these kazoos. And, uh, and the instructional budget of the uh, Divinity School paid for the kazoos. Um, so anyway, the rest is history. Uh, <laughs> Uh, fast forward, those same young women agitated to, uh, for many things, and the faculty said to them, well, we can't start a women's study, we can't teach women's studies, we can't have um, um, courses on women's studies and religion, we can't hire professors in this, because there aren't any, there aren't any women who are specialists in this field who are qualified to be on our faculty who've written books that we can put on our syllabus. So the Women's Studies and Religion program was founded to create those missing pieces. And uh, we've been doing that since the 1970s. Many of those women are now on our faculty and on other theological and university faculties throughout the country. And many of the books that they have written are on your syllabi, I hope. Um, they're on syllabi throughout the country and the world. Um, and so what we do is every year we bring, uh, we do an international search, we read about 100 applications, we bring 
five scholars to the Divinity School for a year who are working on book-length projects that we think are pushing the limits of women's studies and religion, that are expanding the boundaries of our knowledge into new intellectual arenas. They come to the school for a year and they write their book. And what's so thrilling about it is that it is an international program. When the program was founded, in what they thought was very radical language in the 1970s. They said that so that all women will be represented in this program, we will have both black and white scholars. Um, so, you know, intellectual progress is iterative and we're always building <laughs> uh, and learning from uh, both our past successes and failures. And uh, so that question of what it means to have all women represented is one of the ongoing um, adventures of the program. Um, what that, what, who all women are, what that means religiously, internationally, methodologically, um, sexually. It, we just are always, that's a question that is always part of our conversation. And we are in such a privileged position because we bring, um, we bring five women every year. We appoint them to the faculty. They teach a course on their cutting edge research. Um, we have an uh, international group of experts, including Laurel, who advise us to make sure we're getting the best people. And, um, and then uh, they spend a year talking to each other and they come from every place, and uh, what they have in common is women and religion. So they could be talking about any time and place, any religion, any region of the world. It's really mind-boggling, and we have no idea what they're going to bring to us. And since the internet has become part of our application process, it's really expanded our global reach. Last year, for the first time, we had a scholar from um, uh, Iran who, she is the first woman to teach philosophy at the University of Tehran. And uh, part of a small but vibrant coterie of, um, of feminist scholars in religion working in Iran. Um, an incredibly sophisticated, erudite young woman uh, working in Quranic scholarship, working on the female characters in the Quran and what kinds of models of spirituality they bring, what you learn about the Quran from focusing on its female characters. You know, she very much has the Muslim audience in Iran as her audience, um, but she understood that to really advance this area of research, she needed to come to the United States where she could participate in a more open conversation about religion, about women and religion that was not possible for her in her home environment. Um, so she came for a year, she's back in Tehran now, we hope she's well. Um, uh, but that's just an example of the type of scholar that we have um, uh, every year and it just, we have uh, we've had a lot of scholars from Muslim countries. We also have people working in um, textual traditions, both Christian and Jewish and other textual traditions. Um, um, I could can go on and on I'm about that. I'm supposed to be interviewing you, Anne. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I'm like one of those college professors. You flick the switch and I talk for 50 minutes. So you really have to uh, rein me in. I'm sorry. I, can I just say one thing about, it was so inspiring yesterday to be thinking about what is happening here at BYU in relation to what we started in 1973 at Harvard. I really saw the seeds of a very similar kind of initiative. Not that there haven't, hasn't been women's studies and Mormon studies for a long time. Sherry Silver, who introduced me, there are lots of pioneers in the room. But what we saw yesterday was a different kind of support. And, there, and that's what really happens at the WSRP at Harvard, is that women who are already working in this area can bring it to another level 
when they have interlocutors with whom they can intersect, who are doing something completely different. They might be coming from another country, another religion, but they're looking at these issues of women and gender in a way that can help them help each other um, in to really new intellectual dimensions. So congratulations to the folks who are doing that here. So the other question I wanted to ask was, given the international focus of the program at Harvard, what are some of the current cutting edge ideas that international women are bringing that might be, you know, maybe a little bit different from what many Americans would think are the issues involved in, in women's studies and religion? So that's a great question, and that also intersects with the conversation we were having yesterday because so many of the projects involve an international component. And what, you know, now that the LDS is a global church, what different questions does that raise from what kinds of things have been um, talked about before? Um, it's so illuminating. Um, we, you know, American feminists love to fight with each other about definitional issues, and um, I don't see a lot of patience with that abroad. Um, although I can't, in some ways, I can't generalize because, for example, we get women from um, Northern Europe who um, are used to a very open kinds of conversations. Some surprises we've had about that. For example, we had a, a Belgian scholar working on women and Catholicism um, who really saw some issues with Catholic women's organizations in Belgium um, that were maybe more similar to things we would have thought about uh, in the United States 60 or 70 years ago. Um, but we also see the huge problem that women throughout the world face, that feminism um, as an approach is associated with Americanism, modernity, and secularism. And that is, to my mind, that's historically inaccurate but it is an international reality. And so the word feminism can be extremely problematic. Uh, and many scholars do not use it. Um, they are working on women's empowerment, they are working on women's issues, on equal education, um, they're working on all kinds of things, but the term feminism has a lot of baggage and it's often not worthwhile for them to get involved with that. They love when they come here and they can speak freely about feminist theology and um, things like that, which, you know, that's also true of our students at Harvard. The students from the South often do not want to use the term feminism. They feel if they do that, that they will be labeled in ways that are inaccurate and that it won't be helpful to getting their point across. Um, whereas in Cambridge, it's... Uh, a different kind of environment. And would you tell us a little bit about your own work, speaking about the the ways that, that women use power and expression and appear in unusual ways that we haven't always thought about are important. Could you tell us a little bit about your own research currently? Um, sure, um, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I, I just recently got involved in a project that kind of flew into my lap out of nowhere. Um, I got a call from um, a radio interviewer, Brooke Gladstone, in December, and she said, there's this exhibit at the Guggenheim Museum, this very interesting painter named Hilma F. Clint, who's being heralded as a pioneer of abstraction. And Nobody's ever heard of her, and her work was suppressed for a hundred years, and it's changing all kinds of narrative about narratives about modern art, and she was a spirit medium. And she painted these paintings in a trance under spirit direction. Can you help our listeners understand what that means? I said, sure. <laughs> Um, and uh, can, uh, uh, can I have my slide? I have a slide of her paintings, so 
Um, I'll, I'll just start talking about them however long it takes to get the slide up. Hopefully it will emerge. I don't see it. Who's? She's over here. She's, oh, there you are. There you are. Great. Thank you. Um, so um, this was an incredible, uh, fortuitous moment for me because I had actually seen the work of Hilma F. Clint in the 1980s when I was working on my book on spirit mediums and women's rights. Um, and her work appeared for the first time in an ex exhibition in Los Angeles in the 1980s, and it got really very little attention. Um, and I kind of had the same experience when I published Radical Spirits. I, people loved my book, it's still in print, they still assign it, I feel very honored and humbled and gratified by that. But it hasn't had a big impact in the field of women's history. Spirit mediums? Women were empowered by spirits? What is that all about? Um, the, the field of women's history has not found this an easy idea to assimilate and incorporate into narratives of women's history. So, um, uh, so I wasn't surprised that a woman who painted under the influence of spirits didn't get that much attention in the 1980s. But something has happened in the 21st century, and the world is ready now for women who paint under the guidance of spirits. And, um, or at least this one, at least Hilma F. Clint. They're ready for Hilma F. Clint. This is the most popular exhibit that they've ever had at the Guggenheim Museum. It was viewed by over 600,000 people. Um, it, Hilma F. Clint has become a craze in Europe and the United States. You can't buy the catalogs to the show unless you're willing to pay $200 in the resale market. They, I mean, it's just, there's a, a real Hilma F. Clint moment happening. So, and here are the paintings, and you can see they're 10 feet high. They predate any abstract paintings painted by men. He said these paintings were painted in 1907. Um, so, you know, abstract painting has always been seen as this kind of expression of masculine, uh, kind of modern angst and introspection and dealing with your mortality. And um, so, who is this lady who um, was inspired by spirits to paint? paintings of which nobody had ever seen the like. And they're bigger than what Picasso was painting at the time. She painted more of them. Um, and then, and they were paintings for the future. They were ahead of their time. And she was told by the spirits that they should be displayed in a, uh, a temple, that these were paintings for the temple and that they ultimately should be displayed in a spiral that would lead viewers up to a, a spiritual apex. Um, that never happened during her lifetime. The paintings just went into storage basically until about 2013. Um, but they were ultimately displayed at the Guggenheim Museum, which is a a spiral temple to the spirit and to modern art. So what really got me interested in this, and I know I'm talking too long, I'm no, sorry. You've got okay, I'm okay. time, okay. you're fine. Phew, phew. Um, what got me interested here was the relationship between spirituality and abstraction. And the idea that a woman was freed from the, the limits of the figure and the limits of gender by spiritual authorization to paint outside the box, way outside the box. Now, um, I don't have time today to go into all the kind of um, anthrop, well, I don't know, uh, the, the wild symbolism that uh, is in these paintings, but um, I did start, so what I'm working on now is thinking about uh, some other women pioneers of abstraction who were inspired by a spiritual intervention that prompted them to think, of, think, to exceed the limits of what they had thought was spiritually possible, pushing them to exceed the limits of the figure in painting. 
And one of the figures I'm working with is my own grandmother, um, whose work Colleen has seen, whose name is Vicki Sp Sperry, who was an abstract expressionist who became an abstract painter while she was studying Christian science. And she was, um, uh, this is such a fun project for me because it has brought together all the kind of threads of my life, my grandmother's heritage and abstract expressionism, spirit mediumship, uh, and everything in between. Um, my grandmother painted at Hans Hoffmann's studio, the famous uh, site where much of the abstract expressionist school had its birth in Greenwich Village. Uh, and there was a Christian science church with a reading room around the corner. The uh, angry young men of the New York School of Abstract Painters all went to the Cedar Bar, which has become legendary, where Jackson Pollock and de Kooning and everybody else were drinking and drinking, which would ultimately kill them. Most of them died in some way related to alcoholism. Um, but Grandma Vicky, when they were going to the Cedar Bar, was going to the Christian Science Reading Room and reading about how um, the, lim the limits of the body are an expression of mortal mind and that if we think about our immortality and our unity with the infinite and the abstract, that we're no longer governed by the limits of the body. And that's when she abandoned the limits of the figure in her painting. Now, I'm just getting into this, but it's really kind of mind-boggling to th me to think about my little grandma, um, who was, you know, five feet tall. Um, she did paint wild paintings. I unfortunately don't have anything to show you, but they're also huge, abstract, brightly colored works. Um, but when she went to Hans Hoffmann's studio, she sat with the other artists drawing, and there was always a model. There was always a nude woman and she and all these young men were staring at this model and going to their charcoal and drawing, and drawing abstractly, but inspired by the figure. And then she went to the Christian Science Reading Room and read about how the body does not exist. And something happened to her art at that time. She went from the figurative to the abstract. So anyway, I'm having a blast. What's really amazing about your choice to put us together for this conversation is that Colleen has devoted her career to the study of material culture and visual images about which I know nothing. <laughs> um, and I've, that's where I've ended up now. And likewise, Colleen has watched me write about women's history for my entire career, and that's where she is now. So. We're having fun. <laughs> All right, I think it's uh, time to switch. I think, well, I think it's your turn now. Okay, well, to man, ask that was me kind the of hard a good questions. segue. Yeah, well, you asked me some really tough ones, Colleen, so um, uh, I, I'll try to um, uh, be as generous in, in asking you questions. Um, but I do want to start with a story. I'm not going to wait till afterwards for you to ask us the. Um, about each other. I want to tell us a, a very brief story um, that happened just recently. I met a woman from Colorado who is um, one of the movers and shakers of the Jewish community in Colorado. She's the volunteer head of the United Jewish Appeal, which is like the biggest, most important fundraising arm in the Jewish community. and. Um, and I asked her, what are you doing at Harvard Divinity School? She had come to one of our programs. Um, and she said, well, I've always been interested in religious studies. I did my master's degree many, many years ago at the University of Colorado. I said, oh, really? Um, who did you work with? And she said, Colleen McDaniel. I said, really? Well, what did you take with? I didn't know Colleen taught at the University of Colorado. That was..." I didn't think anybody knew her before I did, but that was <laughs> before then. And um, uh, she said, oh yes, I had world religions with Colleen McDonnell. It changed my life. She would come into class every week, we'd do a different religion, and we were completely convinced 
that that week's religion was really what she believed. It was really her faith. And um, we were absolutely convinced by that. And that's what opened my mind to the kind of life that I've led. Um, so Colleen, how do you do it? <laughs> how do you, and, and um, I mean, we're all, I'm, I hope everybody here has either read or has on your nightstand Colleen's book, which um, is such a thrilling example of this practice. Um, then it clearly took you a lifetime of this practice to, to get to this book. So how do you do it? How did you convince the students that every religion is the one that you believe in? Well, you know, I have to say it, it, it connects with the same question or with the question that I get when people say, why do you study religious studies? Why do you, why do, you do what you do? What, what is interesting about the study of religion? And I try to explain that I'm fascinated by people and I'm fascinated by the things that people hold the most dear. I'm, I'm fascinated by the ideas and the commitments that people have which make them who they are. And so if, you are, if you're interested in what people hold dear and what they value, then you're, you are always going to be drawn to, to religion. And so that's one of the things that I try to do is I try to understand why people do what they do, what motivates them, what gets them excited, what, what keeps them up at night. And oftentimes what is, what is dark and deep and painful and hard to cope with. So the thing about religion, which is I think both of us share, is that it it has this jubilatory, this this warm and wonderful, um, exciting element to it. But it also can be very dark. It can be very painful. It can be something which causes people to suffer and to feel as if. Um, something is just not quite right. And so it has these intense characteristics, which I don't see when someone is studying, you know, I'm sure there are geographers in the room, but <laughs> studying geography might not have the same kind of, of intensity. So there's something about the study of religion that, that is um, uh, intense and exciting and that you are interested in just sort of learning about and, 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 and staying with because I'm interested in people and, and listening to what they have, have to say. So listening, either listening when you're reading an archival materials, listening to what, uh, you know, the, the people of the past, the, the spirits of the past, what they say to us in the archival materials, or listening to people who you talk to in present and try to understand what motivates them and what moves them and what makes them sad and why they're disappointed at times, but at other times what makes them uh, 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 elated with, with their life. Thank you. Well, um, Colleen, a lot of your work has been about material culture. Uh, and um, this book is not. Um, but I wondered if you could uh, tell us a bit about why you think it's important to study material culture and how that relates to women's studies. Well, one of the things which I try to do in my work is I try to understand the religious worlds of average people, of people who are not theologically trained, who are not leaders um, on the pulpit who are not the ones who are writing the theology, but who have thoughts and feelings and attitudes and perspectives about their religious lives. And people who are, um, you know, are, the, are the, the hidden elements of history. And obviously women are, because of the way that they have been placed in society, oftentimes not listened to, um, not heard, uh, silent. Um, they're the ones that support a religious tradition but do not direct it. And so how do you understand the fullness of a, of a religion? You have to understand 
the leaders and the directors, oftentimes who are, who are men, but you also have to understand the people who are in the pews, um, as, as Anne has written so brilliantly, you know, that those are the women who, uh, the women are the ones who are, who are making religious history because they are the ones who are carrying the traditions forward. So if you're trying to do that, if you're trying to understand the world of people who have not gone through theological training, for instance, and who are not publishing or um, giving sermons or, or um, doing other forms of formal expressions of their ideas, then you know, where do you look? How do you, how do you figure that out? Where are the places? And so um, I became quite interested in the objects that people use in their religious lives, how they think about those objects, uh, where those objects um, give them a way of kind of coordinating their, their spiritual and their material worlds together. And so I began to look at domestic religion uh, how women in the family uh, express their ideas domestically. So my, my PhD dissertation was called The Christian Home in Victorian America. And it was my first book that I published in the 1980s. And it was important because it had, it had illustrations in it. And in the 80s, that was, that was, you know, that was quite radical, just to have a, you know, pictures. My, one of my favorite pictures was of a, an Angelus clock. And the Angelus is a prayer which Catholics say during, during the various periods of the day. And you could actually buy this clock, which would ring the hours, not of the hours of the day, but of the hours of the Angelus. So there were many il illustrations of this. I, I looked at books that had... Um, engravings of men leading home worship and then engravings of women leading home worship and I try to understand what the father was doing in the home in in ways different than what the mother was doing in the home and so these engravers had had tried to capture this and this was all in the 19th century so it was very much the creation of the home as a sacred space. So the space of the church, which was a place where men were the leaders, was a very different place than the place where women were leaders. And I also, in that book, I looked at Protestant and Catholic materials because for much of the history of American religion, religion was defined as something that Protestants did. And the kinds of activities that Catholics did were considered to be superstitious and bodily oriented and and weren't real religion it just they were just playing out the debates of the reformation only they were playing it out as supposedly objective american historical you know research but catholics somehow were not important because they had a ritual system and a and an obedience system which protestants didn't consider to be uh, what real religious people had. So I've always been interested in uh, the religions that other people mm -hmm. don't think are real or important. So I always sort of gravitate to the things that people don't think are, you know, the, the, where, the, where the thing is, where life is really should be going. But that's always, to me, the most interesting. Well, finally, I do want to give you a chance to talk about Sister Saints, which I'm sure people are, are eager to hear about. Um, I, and Colleen just alluded to an article that I wrote about 20 years ago called um, uh, Women's History is American Religious History, uh, in which I argued that we really won't know the story of American religion until we, we can see it. It, we can center women and tell it from their point of view. No matter what else I do, that is the most cited thing I will ever uh, <laughs> write, um, because that insight so many people have have taken to heart. And you know, sometimes you say something that uh, seems obvious to you, but it's really meaningful to have somebody to quote it to. So that. Um, I, I did ask in that article for historians of women to, and religion in particular, uh, to go beyond telling the stories of religious women and to start 
looking at larger narratives of American history and American religion and to look at how those large stories that we've been telling and are really important and that we will continue to tell are different when we start with women's centrality to religion. Um, it took a long time. I wrote that article. People started quoting it. They were very inspired by it. They started writing dissertations. But um, it was really hard to do that. You did it, girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is exactly what I was asking for. It's so great to, to be able to see Mormon women interacting with national trends, influencing and being influenced by major national developments. Um, I mean, this is really what, what so many of us have been asking for, um, to see these things come together. So what I want to know is um, what made it possible? My sense is that you couldn't have done this 20 years ago. And how I, I would be really interested to know kind of what made it possible for you to do that now and what were you what were you hoping for in bringing in putting Mormon women in this much larger framework well I think the question about could I've done it 20 years ago I mean uh, about 30 years ago my husband and I who's in the audience hello John uh, we we came to Utah and um, I came to to teach religious studies to be the the uh, McMurrin chair and I was basically told okay you should be teaching about the history of American religions but don't really teach about Mormonism because they already know that and and your job is to introduce new things to them your the them being my my poor students the captive audience that I that I have <laughs> And so I said, okay, that's, that sounds great, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I taught American religious history and I introduced my students to Catholics and to Protestants and to Jews. And we had lots of, you know, people who came from various places. And I, I sent my students out to visit the African American church in town and the Jewish synagogue and, you know, the many mosques that we have now in Salt Lake and so on. And, and that was something which I think is very important because oftentimes in Utah, uh, I think my students feel that they are, um, you know, they're the ones who are the majority and all these other groups are just kind of there because we're, we're being nice and we let them in. And they don't really see that all of these religious communities are, are, are lively. They have their own histories. They have their own their own subjects. So, I hope, hopefully, you know, I was able to to show them a wider role of religious expressions, and and I think that that was that worked for a long time. But I had, as I mentioned in the book, I mean, I have many, many friends who come from um, the LDS tradition and who have had conflicts with the religion, but also have others who have found it a, a place of comfort and support and spiritual well-being. And eventually I just decided that this was, a, this was a fascinating religion and that I really wanted to know more about my students and my friends and my neighbors. But I think the thing that is really key that, that makes um, this study different from some of my other studies is the incredible wealth of materials on women that have been um, constructed and are available to scholars here in Utah. Um, I think I saw Jesse Embry somewhere out here. People who have done oral histories and, and uh, have over the years have put their oral histories in libraries. I mean, uh, Kate, who works in the Church History Library, and others of you who I see, who have preserving diaries and family histories and biographies. It is such a rich um, storehouse, a treasure house of materials that have that's barely been scratched. The service has barely been scratched. And so I think part of the what I was able to do was I could take the work that I have done in the past on Catholics and on African Americans and on Jews and with 
material culture and other kinds of ways of seeing this very rich landscape and add that to this incredibly rich body of primary source materials that exists here in Utah. I did some traveling and I, I was able to go to places like South Africa and do some interviewing there. But what, what is really unique in, in Mormon studies is the primary sources that exist in, in Utah. And that it's all in one place. I mean, I was telling yesterday, I was explaining how if you do Catholic history, you're, you're basically, maybe if you're lucky, you're going to an archdiocesan archive, but otherwise you're just knocking on the door. My When I wrote The Spirit of Vatican II, I literally went to churches and said, hi, you know, I'm doing this work. Do you have anything in your basement? And they would open up the door and they would like dig in the little boxes and they say, is this useful? And that's how you do work in American Catholic history because it's all decentered and it's all, you know, it's kind of all over the place, which is very exciting. Um, it's, it's, it's really a discovery, it's a, it's a treasure, but it's very limited. And so having these sources available and, and then having a kind of wide perspective on American history and American religions is how I kind of put it together. Um, can I ask one more question? I have, nobody's yes, told we me this. Yes, okay. five more minutes. Oh, fantastic. Um, so, um, I don't know, the book is still fairly new, so I don't know how much feedback there has been yet. But um, it is a very bold thing to hear living in, uh, you know, in the shadow of the temple in Salt Lake City for you as a non-Mormon to... Oh, you can't hear me? I'm so... Thank you, Laurel. I'm sorry. Um, uh, so I'm really curious about responses to the book that have moved you, um, either that have been surprising or um, disturbing or rewarding, um, if, there, if there has been response at this point. Well, I think the, the one, the response has been the most surprising was that the book won an award of, uh, from the Organization of American Historians, and it won a, an award in, uh, as the best book written in gender and women's history. And that was really surprising because uh, oftentimes American historians, because of their academic training, don't take religion particularly seriously. So for many historians, religion is something that happens because people are poor and therefore they're religious, or, or they're frustrated and therefore they're religious, or they're, you know, they're tense and therefore they're religious. And if you could just give them some food and a good therapist, religion would go away. And, or, or maybe if you could just give them a couple of books to read, then for sure religion would go away. And so they're always kind of, American historians oftentimes are just kind of thinking, if we could just get our economics and our sociology sorted out, then, you know, why study religion? Just study sociology, study, study economics, and, you know, then you can understand people's motivations. And those of us who, you know, do religion, but like, no, that's not true. And you know we are always pushing back. So the fact that that women's historians, who oftentimes would not take women's religious commitments seriously, actually gave my book an award, made me feel a, an amazing, you know, amazingly elated that 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 could happen. So that's sort of that's on a, a big big scale. And I think more on a smaller scale, is people come up and say. I bought your book and I gave it to my mom for, I see Ben Park over here, for you know, Mother's Day and, and my mom really liked it. And that is just of course the best thing that any author can ever hear was that my mom really liked your book. <laughs> so the thing that I would like, however, uh, my, my third goal, if we say this, you know, the, the OEH award and Ben Park's mom, but then it's like now your dad loves my book. Uh -huh. So Father's Day is either, I don't know, is it, it's is it already passed? I missed it. Next Father's Day, I want all the fathers to read my book. So thank you. Well, that is a really great closing remark because to thinking about the development of women's history, that's the next frontier, Father's Day. And um, then we'll, we'll 